introduction thing, and thank you for all of you for uh, uh, participating in that. Uh, do take the attendance quiz uh, today, uh, attendance quiz 16. So what we're going to look at today is Jacob. And we're going to look at the idea of Jacob as the new Adam, kind of the head of the new uh, chosen race. And what we're going to do is we're going to tackle the really difficult question, why does uh, God pick Jacob over Esau? So the Bible is pretty clear that God chooses Jacob. Um, and we want to ask the question of why. When we step back and uh, read the meta narrative, why is it that this one is the one God blesses and this one is he doesn't bless? Um, and there's a text that talks about God hating Esau, and that text is actually quoted in Romans 9, so it's not just an obscure text, it's a kind of prominent text. How are we to understand that? Uh, you know, the Bible said God loved the world, God loved the cosmos. So what do we do with this passage that says God hated Esau? And ultimately, we're going to ask the question, how does all this fit in with the meta narrative? So uh, I have my uh, challenge before me today. This is a difficult uh, um, discussion. Let's dive in. So this is the passage that talks about God hating uh, Esau, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? And the Lord says, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau. So this is, Malachi is the very last chronological book before 420 years of silence from God. The book starts off um, with this uh, troubling statement uh, where the Lord says that he hates Esau. And so when we step back and we kind of uh, look at this idea uh, it's not the first time this has happened. Um, God favors Isaac over Ishmael, and he favors Jacob over Esau. And so the question is, why? Um, why is it that the Bible is saying that God chooses uh, to show his love to these people? And the easiest answer is to say, well, there's something better in these people. And because there's something better in these people, he's choosing them over. And I would like to try to make the case today to you, the jury, that that's the wrong way to read the story that it isn't that somehow God is choosing good people, but rather God is showing grace to people who don't deserve grace. So when we read the meta narrative, I'm going to try to make the case to you today that God isn't picking Jacob because he's better than Esau. So let's, let's see how I do in this argument. I think this argument uh, occurs many times in Scripture, where God comes to two people and shows favor to one and passes one by. And when we looked at Cain versus Abel, remember that um, Eve apparently thinks Cain is the redeemer. He's the required one. He's like God's gift. And remember what Abel's name meant. His name meant the nothing, the emptiness, the vanity, uh, the nobody. And yet, Abel's the one who um, 
receives grace. We're going to make that same case with uh, Esau and Jacob, uh, that God's showing grace to someone who does not deserve grace. Um, if we're reading the Noah story rightly, Noah's family is the one that was guilty of intermarriage, and yet he's the one who finds grace. And remember, the text tells us that, that Noah found not what he deserved in God's eyes, but he found grace. We've made the same argument in terms of Abraham. Was Abraham like more godly than any other people, or did Abraham have problems and God showed him grace? And I, I think um, the case for grace to Abraham is pretty solid. And then even David, uh, remember when uh, God sends Samuel to find a king and uh, Jesse brings his sons to see which one God has chosen, he doesn't even include David in that group because David is this nobody, nothing. And when uh, all seven of his older brothers are passed over, uh, the Bible says God doesn't look on the outward. Uh, God looks on the heart. Um, so this idea of God chosen, uh, choosing the weaker person is something that happens over and over and over again in Scripture. And in, New Test in the New Testament writings, that's exactly how Paul understands it. He says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. God has chosen foolish, the, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. God has chosen the base things of the world and the despised things of the world. God has chosen the things that are not so that he might nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. There's What that text is telling us is there's nobody in heaven who is going to say anything like, I deserve to be here. Uh, no one in heaven is going to say, I'm just, the reason I'm here is because I'm smarter than other people or inherently better than other people or God saw something in me that just made me more savable than other people. No one's going to talk like that in heaven because that's not how this story works. God isn't choosing the good things. Uh, God's choosing the weak things. So I'm trying to argue that this Jacob Esau story is a part of this narrative of God showing grace to the absolutely undeserving. That when you come to the Esau and Jacob story, what the point of that story is, is God showing grace to someone who is absolutely undeserving. And we see that in the Old Testament. Um, God says, I will make my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. It's not about you. It's not about anything in you. God's saying this to Moses. Um, it's about me showing mercy. And then uh, this passage is exactly the one Paul picks up in that most difficult of passages where he talks about election and predestination and choosing and uh, where Paul quotes uh, Jacob I've loved Esau I've hated and Paul says this for he says to Moses I have mercy on whom I have mercy I have compassion on whom I have compassion so then so this is the um, thing you should conclude it depends not on human will it does not depend on human will, but it depends on God who is showing mercy. God who is showing pity. God who is giving something 
to someone that they don't deserve. So let's look at this Esau uh, idea for a second. And I want to ask you the question, is Esau the picture of natural man? That is, is he kind of a new Adam figure? And I want to say, yes, he's a new Adam figure. Well, you say, well, how is he like Adam? Well, he sells his birthright for a meal, right? Adam sold his birthright for a meal. Esau sold his birthright for a meal. Just like Cain, Esau wants to kill his brother. Just like Lamech, Esau is polygamous. He's, Esau is the forefather of Doeg the Edomite who kills, and we're going to look at this story in a second. He's the father of Herod the Great. I don't know if you knew that, but Herod the Great is an Idumean, an Edomite. And he's also the father of Herod Antipas. Esau, Edom, is a new failed Adam. Now, if we were reading this text in Hebrew, uh, we would have an advantage here connecting Esau, Edom with Adam. And here's why. This is how you spell Adam in Hebrew. And this is how you spell Edom in Hebrew. Now, who can spot the obvious difference between those two words? It kind of looks like exactly the same word to me, right? There is no difference. Edom and Adam are the same word in Hebrew. Sometimes uh, it's spelled this way, and... Uh, Hebrew doesn't have vowels, um, so you have to supply your own vowels. And it's possible that this is what's called a mater of actionis, a mother of reading, where they're kind of giving you um, uh, training wheels so that you can kind of read it without vowels. But this word and this word are the same word in the written text, the originally written text. So we're meant to read the um, Esau Edom story as this is kind of Adam happening all over again. And we see that a man who despises his birthright, the result is just terrible wickedness in his family. Uh, when Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Barry the Hittite, to be his wife. Hittites are Canaanites. And he took Basemath, daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. So here's a guy, and he intermarries with Canaanites. What does the Bible say about intermarrying with Canaanites? It says, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And then the anger of Yahweh will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. So uh, Esau is doing what? all fallen men in the Old Testament do, and that is choose beautiful pagan women. And God is saying, I know how this story is going to turn out. Uh, you're not going to turn their heart toward God. They're going to turn your heart toward idols. And that's how it always works out. And that's what happened in Noah's family. That's the strongest man who ever lived. Uh, what trips him up? A, a beautiful a uh, pagan woman. It's what Balaam said, if you want to curse Israel, find the most beautiful pagan women you can. Uh, let them intermarry. Uh, the wisest guy uh, in the Old Testament, what trips him up? Beautiful pagan women. Uh, 
David, the worshiper, uh, psalmist, what trips him up? Uh, a beautiful uh, naked woman uh, turned his heart because there's only one son of God who can marry a daughter of Adam and not have her turn his heart away from God. And that son of God is Jesus. Uh, and his meta narrative is he chooses an unlovely bride and then he turns her into the most beautiful woman who ever lived. So it's a meta narrative, but this uh, intermarrying with beautiful pagan w women, that's what uh, Esau is doing. And God says, this is how it always turns out. So I want to ask a question. Is God's hatred of Esau fair? The text says that God hated Esau. Well, is that fair for him to hate Esau? Well, I might just point out that Esau's offspring is Doeg, Doeg the Edomite. Um, Saul is in the midst of trying to kill David, and um, Saul tells his men to kill all the priests who had helped David, and his men won't do it. And so there's this man there, Doeg the Edomite, and Saul says, kill all the priests. And so Doeg kills all the priests, 85 people. The only reason any priest survived is because one guy was able to uh, slip away before uh, Doeg killed them all. So we have a man who despises his birthright, and then his offspring are willing to kill the priest of God. And you may or may not know, but Herod is an Edomian, which means that he's an Edomite. Uh, that's a little bit hard to follow in English, but it's true historically. Um, Herod, the Edomite, does the same thing. He summons the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go search diligently for the child. When you found him, bring word so that I too may worship him. So he says, you find him, I'll worship. It kind of makes you wonder, why doesn't he go? If this is the incarnation of God, why, why not go? But he sends other people. But then it says, Herod, when he saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem in all that region who were two years old and under. In other words, what he did, he was looking for Jesus, and if Jesus had been in Dayton, uh, he couldn't find Jesus, so he says, well, kill, kill all the kids from Spring City to Sale Creek. Just kill all of them. And that's what he did, trying to get at Jesus. So imagine five miles every direction, killing every baby child that's there because you're trying to kill God incarnate. Is it fair that God hated Esau? And remember, God experiences reality all at once. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows how it's going to turn out. So when Esau uh, sells his birthright and chooses beautiful pagan women over following God. Is it right that God hated him? And I would argue, yes, it's right. Because God knew how it was going to turn out. And it it isn't just Herod the Great. Remember Herod the Great's grandson, Herod Antipas, is the one who mocks Jesus and is the one who kills James and who would have killed Peter and the one who thought he was God on earth. Is it right that God hated Esau? And I would argue yes, but I would add to that Esau is just natural Adam. Esau is a picture of all of us if God just left us alone. It isn't that the seeds of corruption that we inherited in Adam are somehow benign. They're spiritually cancerous. They 
uh, will take over everything. They'll, they'll turn us into this if God left us alone. We see that in our marriage, uh, Esau is intermarrying just like uh, Noah's uh, parents did. Uh, this is, these are the uh, statements that show that uh, um, uh, he's an Edomite. Um, so is it just? It's just, in my opinion. You, you decide for yourself. It seems just to me. And so judgments are pronounced over the house of Esau, Edom, uh, this failed Adam. Um, and God says, I hate what that brought about into the world. But then it says, Jacob, I have loved. And so if it's just, for God to hate Esau, maybe God is loving Jacob because Jacob is good. And I would like to make the case that Jacob isn't good. He's actually worse than Esau. So let me see if I can make that case. So this is my case that Jacob is actually uh, worse than Esau, uh, that it's picking up on this, I will have mercy on, so then it depends not on human will, uh, but on God who is having mercy. That's what I'm trying to argue, that the reason God loves Jacob is because he's showing mercy to someone who should be in hell. Let's see if I can make that case. When the boys grew up, uh, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. We don't know what to make of that. It seems like there's an echo here of Cain and Abel, where Cain is the one who's favored and Jacob is the one who's not favored. So Rebecca wants to do something about it. He knows that uh, Isaac, her husband, loves Esau, and she doesn't want that to be the case. She wants Jacob to be blessed. And so she comes up with this scheme of Jacob dressing up like his brother and tricking Isaac into blessing him. And Jacob is timid about that. And he said, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I will seem to him as one mocking and bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said, let your curse be on me, my son, only obey my voice, bring them to me. And it says, Jacob, listen to her voice. Who else do you know in the story who listened to the voice of a woman giving bad advice. Do you know anybody else like that in the, in the story? Isn't this kind of what Adam did with uh, Eve? So Jacob dressed up like his brother, said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you've told me to do. Sit up and eat the game I've caught that your soul may bless me. So Jacob is lying through his teeth to his father. And God's word says, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged. Jacob, you could argue, is honoring his mother, but he's absolutely dishonoring his father. Isaac said, how is it that you found game so quickly, my son? And he answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. So now he's not only lying to his father, 
but he's implicating Yahweh in his lie. And the text says, don't bear false witness, which is what he's doing. And the text says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I think dressing up like your brother and saying, God has blessed me, that's why I'm here so soon. I think that's taking the name of the Lord your God in vain. What about Jacob's moral life? Is Jacob a good person morally? Esau married two Canaanite women. What about Jacob? Well, this is a story. It says Jacob, and Jacob is 77 years old when this happens. He's an old, old man. Uh, you only get that if you add up the um, uh, numbers, but he's an old, old man. Rachel is really young, so this is one of those just kind of weird cases where a really, really, really old guy is marrying a young, beautiful girl. Jacob loved Rachel and said, Father said, if you work seven years, uh, you can marry her. Uh, Laban said, it's better I give her to you than to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Now that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, uh, somebody told, uh, you know, I know, I know you're smitten with Rachel, but here's the deal. Uh, you work seven years and then I'll give her to you. And he says, yes. And that sounds, I mean, to me, that sounds like it's this really romantic great relationship between Jacob and Rachel. And, and maybe it was uh, at first, but it's not how it plays out over time because this is what happens. Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife for the, my time is completed that I may go into her. This is the uh, standard idiom for sexual relations. Uh, he's saying, look, I, I want to sleep with my wife. And so this is what the story says. Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. In Hebrew, it's the word mishta. It's a drinking feast. Uh, I think we should read that kind of like a kegger or something. Uh, 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 Laban made a kegger. In the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to him. And Jacob went into her and Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came about in the morning. Behold, it was Leah. Now, I think he's doing the kegger thing because he knows this is going to be easier to pull off if Jacob's drunk versus if he's not drunk. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself this question, though, is is Leah complicit in this uh, sin? And I want to argue she's absolutely complicit because she's pretending to be her sister. And, you know, I, I think, you know, in that age when it's, uh, dark at night, you know, that, that that's how they're able to pull this off. It's dark. Maybe Jacob's a little drunk. But all Leah has to do is say, hey, you know I'm Leah, right? And the deal doesn't go down. So if you ever realize this, just as Jacob dressed up like his brother pretended to be his brother Leah pretends to be her sister she's absolutely complicit in this now you guys I want to ask you a question you're Jacob you are smitten with uh, 
uh, Rachel, and you wake up in the morning, you realize Laban had uh, pulled this uh, switcheroo, you know, and you ended up sleeping with Leah. What would you do? Laban says, that's not how we do it around here. Do you guys like to live around here? Because I can tell you what's going to happen if Rachel isn't here right now. Um, you, you may not do it that way around here, but if you want to live to see tomorrow, I don't know, is that over the top or uh, is that what you would do? Or Laban says, so, you know, sleep with this one for a week, you know, have, have a honeymoon. Uh, and then seven more years, uh, but I'll, I'll give you Rachel, um, and, and then you can sleep with her. Don't you want Jacob to say, I'm going to kill you? I don't, I don't know. Am I over the top there? Like if he's so smitten in love, wouldn't you expect him to say, this isn't going to happen. And he says, okay. And, you know, I don't, don't want to be gross here, but what's Rachel doing during this honeymoon week? I can tell you what she's doing. She's in her room crying her eyes out all day, every day, because the man she thought she was smitten in love with is sleeping with her sister. Laban says, that's how we do it. And Jacob says, well, okay. That's how we do it around here. This is the most disgusting thing imaginable. Laban did and completed her week, and he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Well, this is what the Bible says about somebody who does that. You shall not take a woman uh, as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. In fact, if somebody does this in Leviticus 18, they all get stoned because God says it's an abomination if you do this. Can you imagine what life was like with the three of those people where two sisters are competing for affection from the same man? This is disgusting, what Jacob did. Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. Listen, this text is telling you that uh, when two people uh, enter uh, sexual intimacy, there's a love that happens between those uh, people. And even though uh, Leah wasn't supposed to be the one, there was an, a natural affection because they were sharing this sexual intimacy. He served Laban for another seven years when the Lord saw that Leah was hated. Jacob got to the place where he hated Leah. He hated her. He's still having sex with her. But the text says he hated her. What do you think about a man who hates a woman but still willing to have sex with her? How does that make Leah feel, know that she was hated by Jacob, but he's more than willing to, you know, on this regular basis to come by? She was hated. The Lord, in compassion to this 
uh, family who was committing abominable sins, it said the Lord opened her womb. Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for now my husband will love me. When well, Hebrew, uh, Reuben means look, a son. Okay, tell me how that worked in that family with Rachel and Leah. Oh, who you got there? Look. A son. Look, a son. Do you have, oh, you don't have a son. Oh, I have a, look, a son. I mean, what is this? She conceived and bore another son and said, because the Lord has heard me. He has given me a son also, and she called his name, uh, the Lord has heard. Look, a son, the Lord has heard me. She conceived and bore a son, so this time my son, uh, my husband will be attached to me because I bore him three sons. Therefore, his name is attached. She conceived again and bore a son. This time I will praise the Lord, for she said, for therefore she called his name, praise the Lord. Then she ceased bearing. Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children. She envied her sister, said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. And so this is what you don't want to ever say to your wife. Uh, Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. He said, am I in the place of God? God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? Like, are they throwing lamps at this point and slamming doors? She said, here's my servant, Bilhah. Have sex with her. This is exactly what Sarah did, right? This is generational sin. So, so go into the employee, you know. She, she's our employee. Just sleep with the employee. And Jacob says, okay. Okay. And the Bible says, hey, don't commit adultery. If you get married, you know, kind of just have sex within marriage, right? Jacob is, huh, okay. <laughs> Her maid has a baby, and she names the baby Dan, which means judge. Look, a son, God's judged me. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again, which means now Jacob's sleeping with Leah and sleeping with Rachel and sleeping with Bilhah. Rachel names that boy Wrestlings of God. I've wrestled the wrestlings of God with my sister and I. Leah saw that she had ceased bearing. She has an employee. Hey, I've got a great idea. Jacob, you want to sleep with my employee? And Jacob says, okay. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Leah said, good fortune. It's like they're naming these kids barbs at each other. Happy am I? So she called his name Happy. And then the story gets really interesting. In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went out and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Okay, what are mandrakes? Mandrakes are a human-looking root. This is the plant. 
and they're narcotics. So uh, when you harvest this, you can't even touch it or you'll get high. And so this is kind of what you make drugs out of. And we're told from the ancient Jewish sources, they're called love apples in Hebrew. Uh, Duda, they're called. And they're an aphrodisiac. So this is like cocaine Viagra. Sorry, was that too much? <laughs> Reuben went in the, <laughs> and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother. Okay. <laughs> no, no, please, no. Hey, I see that you're not having any more babies. This might help. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said, is it a small thing you've taken away my husband? Wait a second. Who stole whose husband here? I thought Leah stole Rachel's husband, but now she's saying you stole my husband. Would you take away my son's mandrakes? Rachel said, well, he'll sleep with you tonight if you give me the mandrakes. Jacob comes in from the field. Leah goes out and says, uh, you've got to sleep with me tonight because I rented you. She has a baby and names him Rent. That's bad, isn't it? Leah conceived again, so she bore a sixth son. God has endowed me with a good endowment. She called his name Endowment. Afterwards, she bore a daughter, named her the female judge. God remembered Rachel and listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore and said, God has taken away my reproach. And one way to read the word, um, Joseph, is read, he has swept it away. The other way to read it is, may he do it again. May he give me another son. So here's my question. Did God show love to Jacob? because he was a good person. He wasn't a good person. He was a miserable person. He's the kind of person who would sleep with two sisters and have them pit their bodies for his affection against each other. He's the kind of person who's more than happy to sleep with employees. God doesn't love Jacob because he's good. God loves Jacob because of grace. Jacob makes a vow. We don't have any record that he ever paid that vow. He sets up a pillar. God says, don't set up pillars uh, to me. I don't want that. He calls the pillar of how his house, and the Bible says, God can't live in any house a person can build. Jacob uh, is willing to steal his brother's birthright. The Bible says don't steal. When you come to the Jacob story and you go to the Ten Commandments, he breaks all of them. God isn't saving Jacob because he's good. He practices magic. That's what's going on when he does the sticks, a thing called sympathetic magic. Um, Rachel uh, steals her father's pagan gods. Um, Jacob tells God he'll love him if he blesses him. God's not loving Jacob because he's good. God's showing pity. And then we have this story where God comes to him. 
God committed to bless Jacob before Jacob was ever born. Jacob has arranged his wives in order of his affection to them. Two concubines first, Leah next, uh, Rachel and Joseph next, uh, and there he is behind all of them because if Esau comes, they're going to kill all those first. So he's hiding in the back. And the Lord shows up as a man and wrestles him. And Jacob says, you've got to bless me. Then it says, odd thing, it says he touched his hip. And from that point on in Jacob's life, he could never walk rightly again. He had this limp. And it also meant he couldn't run away anymore. So we find out that this is actually the Lord who's wrestling and he says, I can't overcome you. So I'm going to name you Israel, which means the man who wrestles with God and who wins. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to think about it for a while. If the Lord touched Jacob and he limped for the rest of his life. What would have happened if he had in the face? Like, Jacob had been dead. The Lord is letting Jacob win. You've got to bless me. You've got to bless me. And so the Lord says, okay, I'll bless you. But he's blessing him because he promised to bless him before he was ever born. This story is not about God saving someone who's good. This is about God being faithful to a promise that he made before Jacob was ever born. That's why he's showing grace to Jacob. All right. Hope you have a great weekend. I'll see you on Monday.